Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch and News Click, where we'll be talking about the state of the Democratic Party after the Super Tuesday primaries. Former Vice President Joe Biden has won or is leading in at least 10 of the 14 states in which the primaries took place. Billionaire Mike Bloomberg has withdrawn from the contest. And there's a lot of challenges ahead for insurgent candidate Bernie Sanders. To talk more about this, we have with us Eugene Pourier of Breakthrough News, a new US-based media project which is focused on reporting and highlighting the voices of the working class and the organizations and movements that work with them. Thank you, Eugene, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Really Eugene, to begin with, uh, the media reports in the immediate aftermath of uh, Super Tuesday have portrayed this as a massive victory for Biden. And one of the reasons, of course, is that he seems to have won at least 10 states. But is that actually the case, considering the very complicated nature of the delegate count of the Democratic Party? Well, you know, I think that's a good point. I mean, you know, when we look at what's happening right now, and I think people to understand who don't know this contest, it's not simply just the raw vote. And if you win the state, you get some sort of other thing. There's a number of delegates who technically determine the nominee at the convention. Uh, and so those all have to be parceled out vis-a-vis the, vis -vis the various states. So Joe Biden was able to go into the lead because of the 10 states he won. But many of those states, which are smaller states, the delegates are apportioned based on the size and the population of the state, aren't really bringing that much to the table in that regard. And so uh, we don't have the final count from California, which is at the time we're talking still coming in, which is a big, big vote prize as people you know, might imagine it's a large state. But it looks like ultimately what will happen is that at this stage in the race going into next Tuesday and the next couple of races, Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden will probably be you know, somewhere within shouting distance of each other, probably somewhere between you know, three and 20 delegates, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, uh, far away from each other. So there's quite a bit left to play, a number of large states, significant states. So, it, you know, from the terms of, of narrative, from the terms of momentum, I mean, you know, Biden winning states like Virginia and North Carolina that are considered swing states, I think it was a big win for him. It rejuvenated his campaign. It was really the result of, a, of an unbelievable, quite frankly, coalescing of you know, quote unquote, establishment figures who represent more of a status quo politics. So it was good for him in many ways. But I think in terms of the true state of play, as you're speaking to, uh, it's actually still a very close race. Right. So uh, let's look a bit more at the establishment aspect you were talking about, because I think especially for people around the world, sometimes the very complicated nature of the party's politics can be a bit hard to decipher. So we have a candidate who's, uh, say, Biden in this case, who's uh, at best can be described as Britain. I mean, he's made a lot of faux pas. His record is riddled with inconsistencies. And uh, every like there, there's this whole argument about how his campaign is working basically hard to ensure that he's not exposed. And you have a candidate who's been able to inspire a party, bring an entire new uh, set of demographic groups into the, into the party itself. And, you know, generally create a narrative about hope and building a new future. So how is it that the establishment chooses to side with the first candidate? Well, I think that it's really a commentary on the state of, you know, not to seem euphemistic, but ruling elites in the United States, the wealthy, powerful interests. Maybe a good way to encapsulate that is uh, upon Joe Biden's big Super Tuesday showing here, health care stocks, pharmaceutical companies in particular, just surged. So it gives you a sense of the type of interests that are supporting him. One of his main, uh, you know, advisors, Stuart Eisenstadt, is a weapons industry manufacturer. So, I mean, you know, there's a number of individuals who have been coalescing behind Biden. At least 60 billionaires have donated to him. Uh, and that will undoubtedly grow as other candidates, Pete Buttigieg, who had a long list of billionaires himself, uh, their bundlers come off the sidelines. And so I, I, I say all that just to say that this is not some mythical chimera, which is also something that's being talked about in the U.S. news. This is a big piece of Joe Biden's campaign. Now, oh, there is no establishment. It's really just the working class people who are right, right, right. Big, but but that does exist. And I think what it shows is the past 40 years of neoliberal rule, unipolar world dominance that we've seen. I mean, really just the unbridled rule of wealthy and powerful interest over poor and working interests, which we've seen in soaring income inequality, increased precarity in work, uh, you know, stagnating wages going back, quite frankly, beyond the past 40 years, back to 1968, that these individuals do not want to give up any ground at all. They don't want to give an inch to any candidate. I mean, certainly what Bernie Sanders is proposing isn't all that different from many other capitalist countries around the world, things that 
wouldn't be strange in, you know, Singapore, for instance, which last time I checked, no one is claiming is some socialist paradise. Um, so it's not the policies themselves, but I think it's the fact that what Bernie Sanders represents and the movement behind him represents an insurgency against what the status quo represents in a general sense. And so it doesn't become about the politics just, well, could you have capitalism and national health insurance or free college or whatever it may be that I don't think that's the level that this is being pitched at. I really think that it's just, well, we've been making a lot of money. We've been tremendously profitable. We haven't had to have any real trade-offs from the point of view of uh, bosses to workers. You look at the trillion dollar transfer of wealth that Trump put in in terms of the tax cut, right? First thing he does in 2017. Um, so why would we now and if we can see to this person, Bernie Sanders, who's being powered by this, you know, very working class, very racially diverse, very young coalition, where will it stop? It's a slippery slope type of argument. And I think that's why they've coalesced around Biden. I don't think he's necessarily even their preferred candidate, which is why there are so many candidates so deep into the race. But I think at the end of the day, the fear of, of, of essentially the party establishment being overthrown uh, and it being replaced with something that maybe isn't that radical, but at least is a political unknown and certainly has no sympathy for these same neoliberal interests, uh, uh, is a big problem for them. I think it's a big fear. And, and on a personal level, even from the point of view of the campaign establishments, you know, there's a huge, I lived in Washington, D.C. for 15 years, an unbelievable amount of money that is wrapped up in these campaigns. I mean, you see Michael Bloom alone spent $500 million. So, you know, not only do you have this sort of establishment donor class, but you also have the people who uh, do the media buying. Like there's an intermediary. TV stations and the campaigns, you have the people who are working as the consultants on the ads and the digital rollout campaigns and the voter turnout and all of that. And they also have a direct material interest. So you have this coalescence of the sort of actual party apparatus, you know, sort of steel girders combining with the donor class around both the set of ideas and a new potential, you know, political reality on the ground. It's very dangerous to establishment figures. So one of the aspects that's being pointed out, and this connects to your question as well, is that along with the democratic establishment, certain traditional democratic vote bases uh, also turned out for Biden. Basically, the coalition that Hillary Clinton sort of supposedly stitched together in 2016 is kind of continuing with Biden. And I think you yourself pointed out that a lot of players working in the back row, on say in the back end, so to speak, including perhaps even Barack Obama. Obama. So. The question for uh, Bernie here right now and the, his organization is in terms of what are the challenges, especially in terms of bringing out some of the sections that haven't really come out in such numbers so far, but people thought would be the backbone of his campaign, so to speak. So what are the challenges on the ground for the uh, organization there? Bernie's organization, think, that is. No, of course. I think the biggest challenge for Bernie's organization is to really bridge the so the, the turnout gap, if you will, on the one hand, in terms of the populations he's saying he needs to excite in terms of younger voters, working class voters, young working class voters who typically don't vote as much, but also even amongst those populations that vote very durably to really do the electability argument. I mean, one of the most remarkable things when we look at Super Tuesday is you look at some of the exit polling uh, of individuals coming out after they vote and some of what we're seeing in states won by Biden. Alabama, obviously, uh, majority black voters, allegedly a conservative Democratic electorate, 51 percent said that they thought that there should be no private insurance at all, just government health insurance. South Carolina, similar state, 53 percent of people said uh, that they think the U.S. economic system needs a complete and total overhaul. Uh, and, you know, Texas, which is sort of narrowly won by Biden, 57 percent of people saying they had a positive view of socialism. Uh, so you can see here that a lot of people, even people who are voting for Joe Biden, aren't necessarily hostile to Bernie's ideas. But I think many of them feel, well, can we win with this? And better to win rather than lose because there's sort of uh, the devil you know rather yeah. than the devil Any, you don't. Anything so to avoid four more years of Trump, that argument, yeah. Exactly. And, and I think that it's, it's an interesting concept because I think when you look, especially at, say, the black community, uh, you know, you have... And you look at the older subset of the black community that really is making up Biden's support. Bernie's winning the majority of black folks under the age of 40, um, but they're not turning out in the numbers to make a difference. But be that as it may, 
do you, you think that the sort of age group has seen the betrayal of the civil rights movement, the turn towards the liberal economics and the destruction of black inner city neighborhoods, the sort of false promise of, you know, more black elected officials? And I think there's a certain amount of both caution and cynicism that results from that, where people aren't necessarily saying Tennessee, 73 percent of people think all colleges should be free. Joe Biden does not support that. But I think people who are looking at Bernie and saying, it's, I, I like it, but can it get over the and he has to find a way to bridge that gap to make people think, you, you know, and, and the two things are complementary, is that he is trying to convince people, well, the only way to get people who don't normally vote is to, you know, talk about transformative change. And that's what we're saying. But then other people who do normally vote, who he needs to vote for him to create sort of the, the, the sense that he can win, are saying, well, you can never win. So he's in a bit of a double bind here in terms of speaking to almost two totally not two totally different populations, but two populations that almost have two totally different relationships to the election. One that's urging caution because they feel like, you know, we don't need four more years of Trump. And another who may not vote, who's on the fence, who's saying oh, both parties are basically corrupt. We need transformative change. And it's hard for him to speak to those two constituencies. And I think that's his biggest challenge moving forward. Right. And on a connected note, uh, on the other hand, could you also talk a bit about the kind of, say, uh, movements that have been built uh, are being built around this campaign. I mean, one part is, of course, the presidential uh, campaign itself. But there are also a lot of other agendas which are being pushed forth and actually are gaining in popularity. I mean, you talked about healthcare, you talked about education. So could you talk a bit about the kind of inputs that uh, or the kind of perspectives that movements are having on this campaign? No, absolutely. And, and you know, it's been an issue that I think, um, you know, has been embraced by a lot of movements. But in a, in a you know, sort of critical support kind of way. I mean, Bernie is getting a lot of support, but we're even seeing, uh, you know, for instance, from some immigration rights groups, uh, when they were queried about the Bernie campaign taking a little bit of a step back on the issue of criminalizing border crime, or excuse me, uh, on deporting people who were convicted of felonies here in the United States, uh, we're saying, well, you know, look, we wish they wouldn't have taken a step back on that policy, but we're not promoting Bernie Sanders because he's our savior. Uh, we're promoting him because we think he creates the best ground for struggle and that we have to continue. And I think the Bernie Sanders campaign in and of itself is, is really, to some degree, a reflection of what we've seen since the Occupy movement in 2011-2012, the movement for Black Lives, the upsurge in the climate justice movement here, uh, the emergence of you know, what for America is a mass strike wave over the past, you know, 2018 and 2019 alone, the, those two years combined the most strikes of any two-year period in 35 years, most of them driven by strikes of 20,000 workers or more, which in the U.S. are very large strikes. Right. And so we're seeing all of these sort of threads, you know, not necessarily every element of these movements, but significant pieces of it coming together as a big part of, of what's happening with Bernie's base and using the campaign is almost in an echo chamber to reach millions of more people. And so then it becomes sort of a feedback loop because you have organizations that are engaged in the elections, of course, but are also engaged in, you know, more sort of durable political organizing that only views elections as one tactic that are able to also this as an outreach tool and really as a messaging tool to sort of put the idea that I think a lot of people have that many of these issues from income inequality to police brutality to whatever it may be are deeply interconnected. And a political campaign pitched as it is as a struggle for, for power, like what should we do about these problems, um, is also a great way to crystallize this message. And so I think that there are a lot of movements that not only contributed to why Bernie is even able to succeed at this level, but that are then at least attempting to create feedback loops Precise. through the campaign, amplify the message, crystallize the message. And I, I would say that since 2016, we've seen pretty consistently, you know, socialism in particular which is, you know, anti-communism is the official religion of this country, become much less of a verboten word. And that is explicitly, whatever you think about the content of Bernie Sanders' politics, because he is out here saying, I'm a socialist, and if people are going to demonize me, that's on them. And I think that ultimately that has, has meant, even to people who may be considered more radical than him, uh, a big uptick in interest. So not just social movements, but ideological movements have been growing. So the Sanders campaign is kind of like a node uh, for so many of these different trends that have been bubbling up in society in an oppositional way. So, and to finally look at the state of the, possibly the state of the future of the party itself. So we're at a very critical moment because like you said, all these movements, the, ca the campaign, Bernie's campaign has emerged as a node for all these movements. And for many of these movements, a key question will be how much or how, for, how, how much will the establishment go to stop them? I mean, what, to what extent are they willing to go? I mean, to basically stop what is a very popular and 
uh, what do you, uh, insurgent movement. So, do you see that this is also uh, as also this uh, this being a, some kind of a step for a further, uh, say, progress towards political mobilization of another sort as well? Because the Democratic Party itself obviously has huge limitations as an organization which can affect any kind of change. I, I do absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the Democrats and Republicans have, you know, one big difference, right? Like Republicans, people always talk about how they're divided. A lot of Republicans don't support Trump. And then at the end of the day, they all vote for Trump because at the end of the day, they're all right wing capitalists. And so they all have the same conservative social values. So the further right you go, you may think it's annoying because it turns off people who are a little more centrist, a little more liberal. You want to vote for your candidate, but you actually agree with the position. I think from the point of view of the Democrats, the challenge is you have a number of people who want to essentially maintain the status quo, maybe some tweaks, but don't want to speak to some of the broader systemic structural issues that result in these uh, uh, you know, inequalities that we see in all elements of our life, uh, exploitation, oppression. I mean, the fact that you know, the average American couldn't find $400 in emergency uh, in an emergency situation. I mean, those kind of statistics, um, you know, wants to speak to that to some degree, but doesn't really want to speak to the deeper element of it. So the further you move in the direction of resolving those problems, taking serious action on climate change, uh, looking seriously at racism in this country, understanding, you know, the role and the power of uh, corporations and capital and pushing forward the rights of workers, uh, the more you actually you d diverge from the interests of the people who pay the bills in the Democratic exactly. Party. So something can't hold there. And I think what we're seeing right now is there are millions, literally millions of people who want to see the types of changes that Bernie Sanders is bringing. Joe Biden would be like a 180 degree, almost a slap in the face to those people. I don't see how that doesn't result in at least, if it's not a complete split in the Democrats or a collapse of the Democrats, a significant splintering that starts to create new political realities or the other way around. I mean, if Bernie Sanders was to win, I think very seriously you would see a number of quote-unquote establishment Democrats very quickly move either to support Trump or to try to pull together some sort of independent third-party effort with you know perhaps some billionaire uh, emerging who could pay for the whole thing. And, and so either way, I feel like you know the, the center can't hold here and that the questions that are being asked um, by sort of this insurgent Bernie Sanders movement are, are not small questions of policy, but fundamental questions of, of, of orientation of a society and how we run more on profit-centered principles and more on people-centered principles. And I think you, can't, you can only really straddle those two things for but so long uh, before you got to make a choice. Thank you, Eugene. My pleasure. Thank you. That's all we have for today. We'll be covering the U.S. primaries and the election season in the coming months. Keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.